This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in lecture number five in the course Old Testament History, Literature, and Theology. Today's lecture will be on Genesis chapter 1, on verses 1 1 and 1 2, and then a discussion of the days of Genesis. Dr. Ted Hildebrandt. A couple things for next week. You guys are next week working on guess which book? Exodus. Exodus. Okay, do you have to read the whole thing of Exodus, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, see, there's energy, man. Yeah, he's going for the whole thing. Uh, actually, I cut back this year. Um, I, when you read Exodus, there's only select chapters. So it's like the first 20 chapters. You know, it's Moses in the Egypt. You've got to read that stuff. But then once you get into the, uh, where the tabernacle is, I've kind of cut back some of the reading of the tabernacle. Because it goes, to be honest, it goes through it twice, you know. And, and then it's all these details about how the tabernacle is built and things. So we're just going to read select chapters toward like 20. I, I, look in the syllabus, but it'll, it'll say which chapters. And then know the stories of those chapters, and we'll go from there. Uh, there'll be an article on the bloody bridegroom. Say bloody bridegroom fast a few times. And uh, so there, you'll have questions on that when you read that in the text. And so there's an article on that, and I think there's some verses, and so it'll be the normal thing. Know the stories and stuff. No Bible walk, uh, Bible aerobics for, for Exodus. Oh, uh, you know, no Bible aerobics. I, I haven't developed it yet. I think I'm, I may try to develop for Exodus this year. And then there's no, uh, you guys are done your transcriptions. Your transcriptions from your editors should be sent to me in email form uh, today, and we're through with that. So, okay, so basically focus on Exodus and the things there. And then, oh, the other thing is the 10 bucks for the course materials. Some of you still haven't turned in your money and things. I think tomorrow is the last day, and then it goes up to $20, okay? So please, you know, get your stuff into me um, either today or I'll be in my office tomorrow morning from like 9 till 2 and just uh, make sure you get it up there because after tomorrow it's $20, okay? I don't want to be chasing you guys down, so take care of your, your deals. Yeah. No, it should be cash and things, okay? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. So, okay, let's uh, let's get started. We got a lot of stuff to run through today. Uh, we're going to start out with Genesis one one and actually start working with the text today. So far in this class, we've been talking about inspiration. Inspiration, one hundred percent. God speaks to the prophets. We have talked about tran canonization, the collecting of those books into the Word of God. Good. Then we've talked about transmission, where scribal copying, there's been some problems. In translation, there's been some problems. So inspiration, canonization, transmission, and translation. And now we're down to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And so we're going to start today with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we're going to notice what's in verse 2. And how do verses, verse Genesis 1, 1 connect up with Genesis 1, 2? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Does the Bible agree that there is a beginning? Yeah. Uh, some cultures have the earth kind of like going over and over again in these cycles and stuff. The Bible doesn't do that. Is there a beginning in the Bible and is there an end? Yeah. So that means things are things moving in a direction. There's a beginning, there's an end. That means that there's direction, purpose, meaning, and things like that. It's not just all cycled over and over and over again. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now what's the next verse? And this is where the tricky part comes in. And the earth was formless and empty. What was the relationship between this verse? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What is the relationship with that? With And the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So what is the relationship between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2? And there's basically three positions on this, and we'll just kind of go through those three different ways of taking the relationship of these two verses and see how it affects things. Okay, what are the three different ways of looking at this, and which views allow for the earth to be billions of years old? Is, is the earth billions of years old, or is the earth only tens of thousands of years old? There's a big debate on how old the earth is and things, and so this verse, these, the connection between these ver verses will allow for some people to say various options. Now, this first view is called the gap theory. This is the gap theory. Uh, it was held by, has anybody ever heard of the Schofield Reference Bible? Schofield Reference Bible, Philadelphia, anybody from Philadelphia? 
Schofield Reference Bible, Philadelphia College of the Bible, now Philadelphia Biblical University or whatever, had this view. In the beginning, this is the way the gap theory reads this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there was an initial wham, bam. God created all the stuff. Okay, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bam. The earth then became darkness and void, formless and empty. The earth became darkness, formless, and empty. When God originally made things, did he make it good? Did he make it good? And light and things. But here, it became darkness, formless, and empty. And what people suggest then is, what the gap theory suggests, is that this is when Satan fell to the earth. Satan, as an angel of light, was cast to the earth here. And that's why it's a period of darkness. And this is when Satan then made the dinosaurs. And this is where the dinosaurs fit in. Satan is the creator of the dinosaurs, chaos on the earth, and, and this kind of thing. And so this is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Satan's cast to the earth. Satan then does his thing on the earth. And then what you have is, then after Satan does his thing, God says, boom, let there be light. And there is light. And then you have the seven days of creation. The seven days of creation are really seven days of what? Of recreation for this, for this view. The seven days of creation, God is reforming what Satan had messed up. So this is called the gap theory. Do you see why it's called the gap theory? Because you've got God creating here. There's this, a gap where Satan comes in and chaos comes in, formless and empty. And then here, God starts up again. So this verse 2 then is a gap. And that's called the gap theory. Now, are there reasons to support the gap theory? And let me just run through a few of the reasons here, the pros and cons of the gap theory. Uh, the Hebrew word, they say the word hayah, which is the verb to, to, to be or to become. Um, I'm sorry. Anyways, okay. Okay, the, the, uh, it's the Hebrew word hayah means is or became. It can mean either one. And so these people say that hayah means became. So the earth became formless and empty. God originally made it good, and the earth became formless and empty and became dark. God had originally made it light. They made it, it became. And so this word became then says that Satan came down and kind of perverted what God had made. Um, this clarifies, did you ever wonder when did Satan go bad? By the way, does Satan show up in Genesis chapter 3 with the serpent and all that kind of stuff? So, so he's down on the earth in chapter 3. When did he really go bad? Okay, And this gives Satan a place then with this gap theory. You're saying the earth became formless and empty, that Satan was cast to earth. He was an angel of light that was cast to earth during this time period and tells us uh, what happened. A couple passages people use to support this is Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Tell us about a little bit about Satan's career. Uh, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Uh, Isaiah 14 is questionable. Ezekiel 28 may have a better shot at it, but to clarify Satan's initial work. Tohu avohu. Okay, tohu avohu. This is not tofu. This is tohu. Tohu avohu. And this means formless and empty. Basically, formless, and I think the King James says a void or something, but it's formless, formless and empty. And the earth became formless and empty. Tohu vohu. The people that hold the gap theory jump over to Jeremiah chapter 4.23 and they say, hey, there's the statement, tohu vohu, formless and empty. It's used in Jeremiah as a judgment on sin. And therefore, you know what I'm saying, it ties in with Satan and this judgment on sin uh, like that. So uh, these are all things. It gives the dinosaurs, the poor dinosaurs got to have some place to go. And so this puts them in, you know, the dinosaurs, Satan does his thing, he kind of makes dinosaurs. Does Satan, often, does Satan often duplicate the works of God? Does Satan often duplicate the works of God? So now God's going to create some stuff, so Satan tries messing around with stuff. He just, they're big and they got teeth and they eat people and stuff, or actually, I don't know people, but they, you know, so that's, now, here's some negative things on the, on the gap theory. Uh, Ezekiel, or Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 to 26, indeed does mention that tohu vohu, formless and empty. But in Jeremiah, it's a judgment on sin. But in Genesis chapter 1, is there any mention of sin in Genesis chapter 1? Is there any mention of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2 of sin? Sin comes in in Genesis chapter what? Three with the serpent. 
So what are these people doing in the gap theory? Are they reading sin back into that context? Is there any sin in the context of chapters 1 and 2? No. So this is a projection of them taking this back in. And, and the question is, it seems out of context because in Genesis 1, there's no mention of sin. And so therefore, this is, it seems to me, dragging in something into context that shouldn't be there. Uh, is Satan the point in Genesis 1 or 2? Is Satan really the point? Is Satan mentioned anywhere? No, okay. And even when he shows up in the guise of a serpent, is he really mentioned as Satan is a serpent or is it the serpent speaking? And stuff. Yeah, it's a serpent. So we learn that, that uh, the old serpent dragon from the book of Revelation tells us that the serpent was, was Satan. But uh, you got to kind of work with that. So Satan is not the point. To put Satan into Genesis 1-2 just, again, seems out of context. It, it, there's no context for it. The word became darkness should be read as all your translations, modern translations, will read it was. And the earth was formless and empty. The earth did not become formless and empty. The earth was. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. So just, you know, these kind of things. Now, okay, does that make sense then? What I'm going to suggest here is, well, we'll, we'll get to how we're going to resolve this. But, so the gap theory, does the gap theory allow for an old earth? Does the gap theory, with the gap theory, is it possible Satan was messing around down here for a couple billion years? Yeah, yeah, so it's possible. So the gap theory allows for an old earth. Does the gap theory actually give an old place to the dinosaurs? Yeah, it does. So that's in the, this, this theory came up in the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s and things, put out by the Schofield uh, Bible and things. Um, my, dad, my dad held this theory, okay? Uh, now, here's another way to look at the relationship between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Here's another way to look at it, okay? Now, look at how this is translated. Some of your translations, I think the old RSV translated like this. When, this is Genesis 1-1. How does Genesis 1-1 start in your mind? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Here's how some people translate that first verse. When God began to create, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Does that change the meaning? When God began to create, the earth was without form and empty. When God began to create, the earth was without form and empty. Is that different? What, what does this verse assume? Exactly. The earth was already there, and that God came down merely to shape and form the heavens and the earth. Now, by the way, is that different than the way you would normally read that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This view is called a dependent clause view. And what it says is that the first verse is dependent on the second verse, okay? When God began to create... When he began to create, the earth was without form and empty. The earth was already there when he began to create. Is that what the Bible's saying? The earth was already there and God merely shaped it. Okay. So this is the view. When God began to create, the earth was without form, and then God said, let there be light. Okay. So this assumes then that what comes before God? The earth is already there. So the earth, the heavens and the earth are eternal as is God. The heavens and the earth are eternal as is God, and God merely shapes the heavens and the earth. This is the view that's held by this dependent clause view. So I, to be honest, with you, I have problems with this view. Um, how does that change the meaning of the text? Well, what it does is it says there's three things that are eternal, not just God, and that God doesn't God does not create the heavens and the earth like God speak and they come into being. They were already in being, and God merely shapes and fashions them. So this, this view is quite different. What are the problems with this view? And I think that's what we've been going over here. It says that there are three things that are eternal, matter, energy, and God. And God merely works with matter and energy. It, matter and energy already existed, and God merely shapes them. And I think that's a problem. I don't think that's what the Bible is saying, but that's what the RSV said. Now, here's the independent clause view. This, so see, if you have the gap theory, there's a gap between Genesis 1 and 2. Satan's involved. The dependent clause view said that uh, the earth was already there and God just shaped it. 
Okay, it was formless and empty, and God just uh, formed and filled it. The independent clause view goes like this. Independent clause, initial creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Wham, bam. God creates the heavens and the earth. It's kind of like a summary title, a summary independent clause that summarizes the whole thing. He, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, independent clause stands by itself, big thing. Now, the second verse is a negative circumstantial clause. It says, when he originally wham-bammed the earth, okay, God wham-bams, creates the heavens and the earth, what was it initially like? What was it initially like? It was formless and empty. Formless and empty. Okay, when God originally made it, did he make it formless and empty? And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, when God wham-bammed the earth, did he make it perfect? All of a sudden, just wham-bam, everything was there. All the animals were there. Everything was there. Did he just go wham-bam, and it was all there? Did he take time to form and fill it? He took form... So when he originally made it, it was formless and empty. And then in the seven days of creation, he's going to form it, he's going to shape it, and he's going to fill it. So this is a negative, notice it's a negative thing. He originally made the heavens and the earth, and they were formless and empty. And then how does he respond to the formless and emptiness? He shapes it, he forms, and he fills it. And then the main clause, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, so then you have the main clause. So this is kind of uh, the flow of it. And you say, Hillebrand, you hold this view. Why do you hold this view over the other ones? Um, well, will writers write with a certain style? Do writers write in a certain style? Do you have a certain literary style? If I read probably a, a 10 or 20 page document that you wrote and you handed me another one, would I be able to tell that it was written by you or not written by you? Uh, yeah, I think I could tell for a lot of people. Some people not, but, but a lot of people. People write with a certain style. Moses then, um, oh, this is, this is just a graphic of how this works. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and then boom, let there be light, and there's light. So this is kind of an independent clause, a negative circumstantial clause, and then the main clause, and that's kind of a, just a graphic of how to do that. But, okay, um, independent clause view. How does Moses write? Now, how do I know how Moses writes? I don't know, but I've got a book of Genesis that's claimed to be written by Moses. So I look at the next chapter, and guess what I find in the next chapter? Starting with verse 4, in the next chapter, you've got, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. It's kind of like a summary statement. This is an account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Then what's the next verse say? It says, when the Lord made the earth of the heavens, there was no shrub in the field that had yet appeared on the earth. There was no plant in the field, and God had not sent rain. Are all those negative things God had not yet done? No shrubs, no plants, no rain. And so you get this negative circumstantial clause saying there's no shrubs, no plants, no rain. It tells you all these negative things that are not there. And then you hit the main clause. The main clause in verse 7, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. How does chapter 1 differ from chapter 2? In chapter 1, does God work with the skies and the, the, uh, separating the waters above and below? It's about the world. It's about the universe. In chapter 2 is the focus on human beings. And so what you've got is this, this contrast between chapters 1, which is the seven days of creation of the universe, and in chapter 2 he says, okay, I'm going to go after Adam and Eve now. And so he develops in more detail. He mentioned Adam and Eve in chapter 1, but now he goes into more detail on how he formed, actually shaped Adam and shaped Eve and things. So this, this then independent clause, negative circumstantial clause followed by a main clause, is that exactly the same structure that he used in chapter 1? Yes. And so what I'm suggesting is that this structure then in chapter 2 helps us understand how chapter 1 should be understood. Okay, does that make sense? So I'm trying to use Moses to understand Moses. You see? Okay. Anyway, so that's the methodology I'm trying to use. And I think it, it works pretty well here. Uh, by the way, I should say about the gap theory, nobody holds the gap theory anymore. My dad's dead, by the way. And uh, um, anyways, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't say that in a joking manner. But anyways... Uh, 
but um, most of the people held the gap theory. The gap theory has been discredited. There was a guy named uh, uh, Weston Fields. He's a friend of mine. Actually, wrote a 200-page book that destroyed the gap theory, and Weston basically put it to rest and uh, just on the gap theory, and nobody holds it anymore. It doesn't fit the grammar. It doesn't fit the Hebrew grammar. It, it contradicts this literary structure that Moses uses. And by the way, it doesn't help us with Satan. Satan isn't in Genesis 1 or 2. So it, it, it helps with those problems. So literary patterns. Now, does creation argue for the existence of God? There's some beautiful passages in the Bible besides Genesis 1 that talk about creation. I'm going to show you several of them. One of those is chapter 19 of the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 19 goes something like this. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day they pour forth speech. Night unto night they give knowledge. So in other words, the heavens declare the glory of God. Should you be able to, if you were like Dr. Perry Phillips who gave that talk in the Big Bang yesterday, He's an astronomer. Should he be able to use astronomy to look out into the universe and see the handiwork of God? Does that declare the glory of God? Okay. In other words, you have God's word here. This is the Bible. This is God's word. Can we tell something about God from his word? Yes. Is this the most explicit? God has told us what he's like here. Can you also look at God's works and tell something about him? You've got God's word that's flawless and perfect. You've got God's, God, God's word and inspiration was given to the prophets. It was perfect. You've also got God's work. So God's work is in creation. So you can learn something about God. The heavens declare the glory of God. So Psalm 19 is helpful on that in terms of seeing the work. Now, modernity, back in my generation, they had like modernity, okay? And these people basically said, the universe is rational and natural. There was no room for God. There was no room for God because everything could be explained by, it was a closed system. The universe is a closed system explained by cause and effects. There are no miracles. God cannot act in real space and time. There are no miracles. Miracles cannot exist, okay? Everything is by natural causes, and therefore miracles do not exist. Everything follows logical rules of cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect, all the way back to the beginning. Cause, effect, cause, effect. And there is no God at the beginning. There is no God at the beginning. There's nothing there. There's no miracles, nothing. By the way, what's the problem? If you have a miracle, if the Red Sea just separates and people go across, uh, question, is that a natural phenomenon? <laughs> no, and then you get across, and what happens next? Whoosh, it goes down, and all the Egyptians drowned, okay? And you say, hmm, that was pretty lucky. And you say, no, no, water doesn't open like that, okay? Um, I've always taught my class, uh, and I'm on tape now, but I, I need to do it anyways. You know, you guys are going to go out and get a job someday. It's really important that you learn certain, you know, like skills of how to deal with real life besides academics and things. So I want to teach you about plumbing today. There's two things you know, and then you can be a plumber, okay? There's two things that you need to know. Water flows downhill, payday's on Friday. <laughs> Got it? Water flows downhill, payday's on Friday. Okay, we're all plumbers now. So you can go out and say, put in your resume, I'm a plumber. Anyways, uh, I'm joking, but not really. Anyways, uh, yeah, yeah, actually, okay. What I'm trying to say here is, when water separates, when water separates with a wall on one side and with a wall on another, and people walk in the middle, is that, you know what I'm saying, water flows downhill, that doesn't work, okay? And so that's, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. God does that kind of stuff. God does that kind of stuff. It's not natural. So the, the modernists from the, basically the 19th and the 20th century said any miracles in the Bible are mere legends. Any miracles, are, they didn't happen historically. Somebody made them up, they were just mere legends, that was modernity. You guys live in what's called postmodernity. And in postmodernity, they come in different. Everybody has their own story. Question, does your generation believe in miracles? Does your generation believe in miracles? Things happening that are spectacular, you've seen it all the time, okay? So you've seen stuff that, that's kind of incredible, and you say, miracles don't bother this generation at all. It's just, everybody has their own story, but the story of God is irrelevant to most. I mean, you know, God's not part of my story, so then you just kind of can ignore him. But the, the miracle thing is not necessarily fought in your generation. Your generation can accept miracles, and it's no big deal. By the way, is it a big deal? 
When God does a miracle, is it a big deal? It's a big deal. But, you know, so... Anyway, so post-modernity is much more fragmented. It's much more fragmented. Modernity, everything was logical, connected, and worked, and things like that. In your generation, you guys have seen nothing works, right? In your generation, nothing works, right? Oh, that's right. You haven't... Okay. Uh, you think I'm talking about the government. You're right. <laughs> Anyways, so... In other words, you, you see that a lot of things... Uh, how should I say... By the way, let me just even go into the families. Do a lot of the families... We just went to my daughter in marriage and all this stuff. I drove over Labor Day weekend out to celebrate that with my family. All the kids were there. It was one of the best times of my life, actually. I'll never forget it. She got married and stuff like that. But question, is life chaotic? Is life chaotic? Yeah, it's really chaotic. Um, and, you know, you're intersecting with families that are all... You know, falling apart. Have you guys, many, I, I guarantee you, probably most of you have seen divorces go down in families and infidelity and all sorts of stuff. Is, is life upside down? Is life upside down for many people? And what I'm saying is that's the way the world is today. So all this order of modernity, everything being logically connected, everything's upside down now. And so there's, everything's fragmented. Nothing, nothing makes sense. It's all broken apart. And, uh, and so you just kind of have to grab it where you can, right? And just make, you know, so it's, it's just different. Some things just to think about in the background of things. Where did Moses get his material? Um, when I was younger, I, I thought that God maybe just came down and zapped him, you know, said, you know, maybe put a chip in his head or something back of his, oh, that was uh, the Matrix, okay, can't do it. Anyways, uh, but he just put a chip in his head and downloaded the stuff into his brain and said, basically, this is what happened, Moses. And Moses writes it down. God says, you know, Bereshit bara Elohim. And Moses says, okay, slow down, God. I can't even get a slow thing on my uh, computer here. And he types it up and puts it down, you know. Uh, divine zapping. God zapped it into his brain, and God spoke to him in words, and Moses wrote it down. By the way, is it possible, by the way, did some of the prophets, did actually God come down and speak to him, and they wrote it down on the spot? Jeremiah tells us. And not only did he do it once, Jeremiah writes it down, and God says, okay, Jeremiah, write this stuff down. Get a, first of all, he says, Jeremiah, get a scribe. I'm going to talk and tell you, you tell the scribe what to write down. So Jeremiah, thus saith the Lord, he goes to the scribe, the scribe writes it down, and he says, take it to the king. What's the king do? takes it to the king, the king takes the word of God the, from the scribe, directly from God, and he basically rips it up and shreds and burns the whole fucking thing up, okay? It's like, holy cow, the word of God just went up in spokes, right? What's God say? Jeremiah, come back here. And basically gets the scribe and he, rep and he does it again. And this time, it's in the king's face. Question, you burn the word of God, what happens to you? Bad things, okay? It's not a good idea. So anyways, don't do that. Jeremiah already did. It's already in the Bible and stuff. That you don't want to be that king, okay? But anyways, the king did it, but then Jeremiah dictated. Did Jeremiah dictate that stuff twice? Yeah, he dictated it twice, wrote it down twice. And uh, so anyway, sometimes God speaks. What I'm saying is sometimes God comes down and speaks. Sometimes it's audible. Sometimes it's audible. The guys actually heard it audibly. Sometimes it was in their mind, things. But what do you do with this? What do you do with the Enuma Elish? What do you do with the Enuma Elish? It's a Babylonian creation account. What do you do with the Babylonian creation account? And by the way, have you ever heard of this guy here? Gilgamesh. Uh, let me just do Gilgamesh first because he's probably more familiar with you guys. But Gilgamesh, uh, is he before Moses? Many hundreds of years before Moses. Many hundreds of years before Moses. Could he have copied from Moses? No, he's hundreds of years before Moses, okay? Gilgamesh, okay? Utnap Pishtim was his name, actually. Utnap, we'll call him for short. Utnap goes out, and, and, the, and the gods come down, and basically he's told to build a boat. So Utnap Pishtim builds this boat, and by the way, all these animals come to the boat. He tells, he gets his family plus a whole bunch of other people, and they put him on the boat. And then he's on the boat for a while. The flood comes, lifts up the boat, drowns out the people. By the way, in the Gilgamesh epic, why were the people flooded out, destroyed? Yeah, they were too loud and stuff. See? You do that rap music? You see what can happen to you? <laughs> All right, so, anyways, it's just too loud. No heavy metal, man. And so he just, the, and the gods were just upset. Mankind's making too much noise, drowned them out. Okay, so he, he floods them out. But by the way, when they're in the boat, and this time the flood goes down, how does, how does Utnap get off the boat? Does he send out some birds, even? 
Yeah, he sends out some birds. So you've got a guy, builds a boat, gets his family, gets the animals on there. The boat rises up. The boat goes down and stuff. He sends birds out and stuff and then comes out. Does that sound fairly familiar? Uh, hmm, okay. Did Moses know the story of Gilgamesh? Interesting. What about the Enuma Elish? It's a creation account that comes from Babylon. Again, before the time of Moses. You've got a divine spirit in primeval chaos. Light emanates from the God. It's God's plural. Firmament is made. The dry land is made. Luminaries are made. And notice man is made last. And then after that, the gods rested. Does that sound familiar in terms of its basic structure? Is it possible that Moses uh, copied the stuff, just didn't put down the footnote to the Gilgamesh epic and the Enuma Elish? Is, are there similarities there? Yes, there are. Now you say, Hildebrandt, somebody here's done some ancient Near Eastern stuff, says, Hildebrandt, you, uh, you faked them out because you didn't tell them the real truth. You, 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 you picked out the stuff that's all similar. Did I drop all the stuff that's dissimilar? You know how the gods made the ancient world? The gods had a war, basically, and they took one of the gods and they cut her in two and made part of her part the body and the other part the sky. And stuff. Is that a little bit different than the Bible? Yeah, but okay, but then to take the blood, and, oh, the blood, okay. Well, anyways, so let's get out of there. All I'm saying is I, I've, I've kind of milked this in one direction. Are these stories, but even though they're very different when you actually read it, and actually the Enuma Elish is trying to promote Marduk, the king of Babylon, um, are there similarities? Are there similarities? Now, does that surprise me? And the answer is no. We have not talked about, and this is very important, and I haven't talked about it, and I, I, I'm not going to develop, I'm going to do, do a terrible job at this. You need to take a course on Borgman or somebody that, that, that develops this more. Originally, when people were really, really, really old, be like before Moses, before 2000 BC, did a lot of the poetry and a lot of the legends and stuff come down orally? Is oral different than written? Is oral different than written? Noah gets off the boat. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are his kids. They come off the boat. They were on the boat with Noah. Do you think Shem, Ham, and Japheth ever told their kids about Grandpa Noah and what happened with all these animals? Okay, yeah. So Shem, Ham, and Japheth tell their kids. Now, by the way, would their kids be able to go talk to Grandpa Noah and say, hey, Grandpa Noah, Dad said this. Did that really happen like that? Would Grandpa Noah be able to straighten them out? Okay, do you ever have Grandpa straighten you out? Anyways, so, but then what would happen? After three or four generations, would the story probably migrate? Would there be differences in the story? What's one of the, pro what's one of the beautiful and one of the problems of oral tradition? When oral stuff comes down, does it change from generation to generation? Let me be more specific. Um, okay, my son gets back from Afghanistan. He's telling oral stories. He just didn't have time to kind of like write them down because he was getting actually shot at every single day he went out. They were shot at, okay? So he didn't take the time to write this down. So these are oral traditions. So now he tells them he's got a brother, Zach, and a couple sisters and stuff. And so we're sitting around the table, and he's a wonderful storyteller, and he tells stories. And so he tells a story, and all of a sudden, Everybody is laughing their head off. He tells us something that was really, really stupid, and it was really, really funny. And everybody's laughing their heads off and things like that, and he tells a story. The children leave. My, my kids, okay, leave. Elliot turns now to the old man, me, and his wonderful mother, and question, does he tell us the same story and when he tells it the second time, his parents are almost in tears. Question, was it the same story? Yeah, it was the same story. Question, did he leave out some details? Yes, he did. And when the kids left, uh, he dropped some stuff on us that just totally blew me away. Question, was it the same story? Yeah, it's the same story. Can you tell a different story? You know who's great on this? Dr. Graham Bird here. Do you ever hear him play the piano? If you got him, and he get, you get in his course, you say, hey, Hildebrand says, you got to play the piano for this class. He plays jazz. So he'll play the same song, but does he ever play the same song the exact same way? No. He, he does jazz. And so depending on who you are, do you tell the story differently to somebody who's 12 to 14 than you do somebody that's, uh, say, 54 to 60? 
you tell the story differently. And when Dr. Bird plays the piano, he'll play it one way and he'll play exactly the same song. You can hear it's the same song, but is it different? It's jazz. And so what I'm saying is in oral tradition, do people jazz the story? In other words, you never tell the story exactly the same way. Noah tells it to his, well, Noah didn't tell it to his kids. His kids were there. The kids tell a story to the story down and stuff. Would you expect the story then to come down in variant form? And what Moses did, I think, is I think that Gilgamesh Epic is remembering, what not pished him, is remembering the Noetic flood. Only it's come down orally, and so it's got corrupted. And what you have with Moses is that God comes down and says, Moses, let me tell you what really happened. And now you've got it from God coming, saying, hey, this is what really happened. Now, by the way, did the other people passing the story down, do they have the shell of the story? Yes, they do. But, they, but how should I say, God gives... You know, the interpretation, as I say, God gives his interpretation the issue, but pretty much he did the interpretation, so it's kind of right. And so God tells Moses what happened. So therefore, I'm not surprised, I'm not surprised that there are echoes, that there are echoes in other cultures that remember the story of the flood. I'm not surprised. God flooded them out, and I would expect other cultures to remember that and pass it down. Now, my guess is they didn't know Jehovah. They didn't know what was going on with it and stuff, so they made up, well, what was going on? Was it Baal, you know, smoking out Asherah, or what's the deal here? I mean, you know, the, the gods fighting or what? So, okay, does that make sense to you then? So I would expect some of the stories to be similar, and then God gives Moses what, you know, revelation from God. And so that's how I'd account for the Genesis. That's how I'd account for the similarities. That's also how I'd account for the differences. Now, by the way, is oral tradition, is it beautiful? Yeah. In some cultures, uh, they memorize, uh, when you go back with Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey, some of the people in Croatia and stuff have 1,200 lines of poetry memorized, and they, they perform it. And every time they perform it, it's, ah, uh, you know, some of you do theater. When you do theater, have you ever done theater one night, two nights, three nights? Question, every night, is it different? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same, yes, but it, it's different. Every night you perform that, there'll be something a little different. You had a question? Um, yeah, so there's a flood, and everything got destroyed. Okay. Mm -hmm. all the right. So after that point, wouldn't all the stories be the same? Right. So when Noah gives the story, his kids, they saw it. The story is the same. Now his kids come. And I want to say they probably check back with Grandpa. So the story is probably pretty close. Now, they have kids. Now, Grandpa dies, and the parents die. Now there's no way to check the story. And so the story, it's like if I told somebody here to say something, and you passed around orally, by the time it got to you, it would be very different than what I said. So you know what I'm saying? Orally, the stories change. By the way, this, what I'm telling you is fact. We, we know this. We can compare. Um, Actually, in other cultures, creation cultures, the oral thing has been checked out. And, and but, well, you should just know that. I mean, if I, if I started something here and I told him three sentences, and everybody had to repeat those three sentences all the way, by the time it got to you, would it be the same or different? It would be different. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How long is it between Noah and Moses? We're talking thousands of years. I mean, I, 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 I uh, Jericho, Jericho, you just with the Battle of Jericho? Jericho, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a humongous uh, tower bedded there. It's 8,000 BC. And so that means Noah has to come before that. So then you've got 8,000 down to Moses' 1,400. So you've got 7,000 years there. Stories can change a lot in 7,000 years. Gilgamesh epic, let's say 2,000. So we've got at least, at least, you know, five, 7,000 years that it's got to be told over. And my guess is it was much longer than that. But, but I can prove you can't have it any shorter than that because you got to account for towers there in the city of Damascus. There's various places that we know, you know what I'm saying? So you, you, you've got to at least give me thousands of years. Yeah. How many generations would you ask to know Oh, gee. Um, no, I can't do that. As, well, let me just tell you, theoretically, I can't do that. Let me just caution you about something, okay? You say, you know those genealogies in chapters 5 and 11? Did you read the genealogies in Genesis there? No, no, no. You don't add those up. Genealogies have holes in them. They're not, when it says so-and-so is the father of, okay, let me just do Matthew chapter 1. Jesus Christ, 
the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Jesus Christ, the son of David, Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Jesus Christ, the son of David. Now you guys know, David's what? Date, give me a date. Jesus Christ, the son of David, that's a thousand years. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham's what? So you guys know that. So question, was Jesus Christ the son of David? See, he said no. I say yeah. You know what son of means? Son of means descendant of. Son of does not necessarily mean direct descendant. And father can mean our, well, you guys even say till this day, our father Abraham. Uh, like, you know, he's not really your father, is he? He's Dr. Wilson's father. So. <laughs> all right. All right. So, okay, that's, that was bad. <laughs> Edit that. Uh, okay. Now, but no, but you see, the point that I'm making, the point that I'm making is, you see what I'm saying? So when you go back into those genealogies in Genesis chapter 5 and 11, I will guarantee you there are holes there, and these guys are living 900 years anyway, and you've got, so you've got huge gaps. You can't do that. It's impossible. There's holes, and so, we, so I can't give you an estimate. All I know is Moses is about 1,400, 1,200, and I'll tell you Noah has to be before, before 8,000 because I mean, we've got that tower at Jericho. So that's, that's what? Almost 6,500 6, years, 6,500 years. How many generations? I don't know. And, and by the way, I, I don't, it's not just that tower at Jericho. You're going to have to push it back farther than that too. So, okay. Good questions. I just don't know the answer. Okay. Now, was a Moses aware of was a Moses aware of literature like the Gilgamesh epic and the Enuma Elish? Well, you say no. Moses was raised out in the desert, chasing sheep. He barely, you know, Moses didn't really know this literature and stuff. He was Jewish. He couldn't read all this literature anyways because he was Hebrew. And uh, question: Was Moses ignorant? Actually, he, where was Moses trained? Where did Moses get his training? Out in the desert with the sheep? Egypt. He was tutored as Pharaoh's da daughter's son. Okay, Would he have been trained in the wisdom of Egypt? Were, were the Egyptians exceedingly illiterate and, and a, a brilliant culture? And we're talking old Egyptian going back to Tahotep that I messed with and stuff goes back to about 2800 BC. That's like 1400 years before Moses. Was there wisdom literature 1400 years before Moses? Yeah, there was a whole, you know, old Egyptian, there was middle Egyptian, and, and Moses, there was a huge literary tradition prior to Moses. So Moses would, and by the way, would Moses have known about Mesopotamia legends? Was there, was there any trade between Egypt and Mesopotamia? Those are the two big cats, man. That's why they call it the Fertile Crescents. There was stuff going back and forth all the time. So my guess is Moses knew some of these stories and, and may have adapted them, adopted them. God, you know, used to, and to Moses to straighten it out. Could Moses have borrowed some of his stuff from these things, from these legends? And the answer is yes, he could have. And God, is everything that pagan people say wrong? Is everything that pagan people say wrong? Or do pagan people say some things that are right sometimes? And if they're right, can God include them in the Bible? Are there some pagan people who speak in the Bible and speak truth in the Bible? Let me do this. Are there even some donkeys that talk in the Bible and say the truth? Yeah, the donkey speaks the truth. Numbers chapter 24, or 22, excuse me. So, okay, now, this is the Toledot structure of Genesis. This is, I think, interesting, but it's interesting from a literary standpoint. Toledot means, it's translated King James, I believe. These are the generations of. I think your NIV, if you've got your Bibles, you may want to pop them open, because this is it's fairly interesting to actually look at how your Bibles do this. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, you've got one of these Toledotes. These Toledos, this is the account of, this is the account of the heavens and the earth, what day they were created. Okay, this is the account of, and what you find is there are 10 Toledotes in the book of Genesis. So Genesis is broken up into like 10 sections based on this phrase, this is the account of. Is this how Moses breaks his own book up? This is how Moses, writing his book, breaks it up. This is his paragraph divider kind of thing. By the way, did Moses, if you went up to Moses and says, Moses, how many chapters in Genesis? You guys are smarter than Moses. 
Okay? If you went to Moses and said, Moses, how many chapters in Genesis? Would Moses know the answer to that question? No, he wouldn't. There were no chapters back then. When he wrote, he didn't write in chapters. Do you realize your Bible has chapters in it? Do you realize those chapters were added about 1200 A.D.? Now, by the way, again, I'm standing over here. I'm telling you the truth. There was a bishop. Um, Dr. McCray was a guy I studied under. Um, some rumor is that he knew this bishop personally. But 1200 A.D., this bishop, and McCray always said that he was riding on a horse, and sometimes his chapter divisions would be up here, and sometimes they'd be down there, and sometimes he'd get it right. Are some of the chapter divisions in the wrong place? Let me show you an example of that from your Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Look at this. He missed the chapter division. Now, by the way, does this mean the Bible is narrow, or does that mean that this bishop in 1200 put the chapter division in the wrong place? Now, let me prove that to you. Go look at your own Bibles now. Genesis chapter, look at chapter 2. Chapter 1 is the what? Seven days of creation. But the problem is, seven days of creation, Genesis chapter 1, but where is the seventh day? Is the seventh day in chapter 1? No. The seventh day is, it says, and thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their vast array. By the seventh day, the God had finished the work that he, was, that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. That's in chapter 2. The seventh day is in chapter 2. Should the seven days of creation be put together? Yes. And by the way, look down to verse 4. Now, by the way, does your NIV Bible, does your NRSV, does your ESV Bible divide between verse, chapter 2, verse 3, and chapter 2, verse 4? Is there a space there? Oh, man, some of you are shaking your head no. Do, do a lot of your Bibles have a space there? There should be a space there, okay? That's where the chapter division should have been put because this phrase says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. This Toledot structure is a dividing. This is what Moses uses to divide the narrative into his ten sections. This is how Moses divides it. So there should be a little division there. By the way, do some of you have those mini Bibles where they put the text on top of the text at the top so they don't do the white space thing because they're trying to get it real small? So some of them may have scrunched it together just not because they don't know it divides it too far, but just because they're trying to save space. But um, anyway, so actually go from 2.4, go over to, to 5.1. And here you'll see right at the chapter division in chapter 5, how does it start out? This is the written account of Adam's line. So now you've got the genealogy of Adam and that stuff coming after that. Go over to chapter 6, verse 9. You can see in my NIV it puts this statement off by itself. This is the account of Noah. So after chapter 6, verse 9, boom, you get a story about Noah and his kids. And then you go over to chapter 10, verse 1, you'll see the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then it goes on to a genealogy of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So this, this is the account of, this is how the book of Genesis is structured, using this phrase, Moses puts it in it ten times and structures his book that way. So, the tablet structure. Did you notice while you were reading Genesis that you get a little bit of history and then it gives you a genealogy? What do you do? You read the history and then you hit the genealogy. What do you do? You skip the genealogy. You hit the history and then you skip the genealogy. History and skip the genealogy. Okay, is that how we read as Americans, okay? Um, were they more into genealogies than we are? Well, it's always your grandmother. So anyways, uh, your, your grandmothers and grandfathers always do the genealogy thing. But anyways, so history and genealogy, history and genealogy. You see how it oscillates in the text back and forth between history and genealogy. Well, it turns out somebody has developed, they dug up some tablets, they dug up some tablets. First of all, what did people write on back then? They wrote on mud tablets, in Mesopotamia in particular, mud tablets. And so therefore they took a pen and they stuck the mud, and the mud dries, and then you can read it. Mud tablets. Are we glad that they use mud tablets? What's the problem with paper? Uh, give me paper 500 years. What's wrong with paper? Paper ain't no more, okay? In other words, paper with moisture, what happens? It goes to nothing. It goes to dust, okay? Back to dust. From dust thou art, dust thou shall return, okay? What's the deal with, with, with tablets? Tablets, you put the tablets in these boxes and stuff, and then you burn the temple down over the tablets. You burn it to the ground. What does that do to the tablets? It fires them. What does that make these tablets? Hard as rock now. Question, do they last forever? 
and we dig them up, what, 3,000 years later, we dig them up, we pull a tablet out, and what is it? We, can we read that stuff now? Oh, yes, since you all should take Akkadian and Ugaritic, and you can read the tablets and things like that. No, seriously, some people spend, go to the University of Pennsylvania, the guys, they don't let them out, they lock them down there for like half their life, and then after they spend half their life there, they give them a PhD. But anyways, sorry. Uh, but anyways, these tablets, these tablets are fired. Do you know how important it is that they wrote on mud for us? Because then we've got these tablets now, and we can read them after 3,000 years. What's the problem with papyrus and all the paper stuff? The only, way, the only place the paper stuff is going to make it, like papyrus and that kind of, uh, they wrote on uh, animal hides and stuff, the only place that's going to make it is down in Egypt. Why does it make it in Egypt? Because Egypt is very, very, very what? Dry. Dry. Okay, there's no humidity in the air. It's the Sahara Desert for, and you know, the Libyans are shooting that, and so it makes it even drier. But it just, uh, what I'm saying is that it's so dry that Egypt is the only place that papyrus really survives. And by the way, was it really good? The Egyptians, did the Egyptians write on the rocks also? Did they carve stuff in rocks? That's really good for us too, because the rocks last a long time. God did some stuff in rocks too, um, with his finger. But anyways, this is how the tablets, this, this oscillation of history back and forth, you get that in the Bible, this history, genealogy, history, genealogy. And what this guy noticed on some of these tablets that he was reading was that the tablet structure was the front of the tablet, and then you have the back of the tablet. And on the front of the tablet, he noticed there was a title, a history, a colophon is like a scribal note saying, this tablet's mine. The genealogy on the back. So the genealogy was the back and the summary. So therefore, this, when, when it comes in our Bible, there would be an oscillation between history and genealogy. History and genealogy. Front of the tablet, back of the tablet. Front of the tablet, back of the tablet. So therefore, what he's saying is, does Moses' style fit the style of writing of that day? Would you expect that? Okay. So does this, you know what I'm saying? So this may be an explanation of why you have the history of genealogy. Now, by the way, do we know this? No, no, this is some scholar's conjecture. Does it make sense? It makes sense to me, but, but I'm not saying it's fact, okay? You know what I'm saying? This guy's conjecture, we don't know for sure, but, but it does, does seem to make sense. Yeah. What's the colophon? Colophon is a, like a scribal note, and it'll say, oh, you know, I am Shafan, the chief scribe, and this is my tablet, or something like that. Or, or um, you know, this was written for um, Zimri Lin, uh, he was king, and he didn't beat me up, so I wrote this tablet for him or something like, you know, some sort of scribal little note um, type of thing, yeah. Good. Did Moses use this structure in the writing of Genesis, okay? Um, did Moses use literary patterns from his day? Did Moses use literary patterns of his day? Did Moses use the language of his day? Um, Moses wrote probably in Hebrew, right? So Moses is writing Hebrew. What is the Hebrew language? Let me just kind of be upfront and honest with you on this. Is the Hebrew language a Canaanite dialect? The Hebrew language is a Canaanite dialect. Where did the Jews get the Hebrew language? They got the Hebrew language when Abraham moved into the land of Canaan. They picked it up there. It was a Canaanite dialect. It was developed about 1800 BC. Now, 1800 BC is a long time. Abraham and the people that were the Canaanite dialects picked it up, and then basically it was passed down and became the Hebrew language. But it's really a Canaanite dialect. Would Abraham would have come in from? Would Abraham have had a Mesopotamian language when he came in from his home in Mesopotamia? Yeah, and he gets into Canaan, he kind of adapts it and stuff, and then it comes down to Moses and goes off. Now, did Moses write in the language of the people? Yes. Would he write in the style of the people? Uh, by the way, are there certain styles of writing that change over a period of time? If you wrote a letter and you wrote an email, would there be two different styles for how you'd write a letter and write an email? When you write on Facebook, is that different than you write on an email? When you do a Twitter, is that different than you'd write on an email? Okay, do we have different styles today? Yeah. Would Moses have had different literary styles that he uses? And I will show you that the book of Deuteronomy is like an exact form shape of a Hittite treaty. It is almost exactly the shape of a Hittite treaty. The content is different, but the form is similar. Okay, the form is exactly the same few modifications of a Hittite treaty. Is that what we would expect? That Moses uses the language of the time, he also uses the literary forms of the time. 
And so the style and things like that, we'll look at that. If Moses used the style of writing of his day, is it possible to use the content of what some of the people of that day held? In other words, um, for example, did the people in Moses' day hold that the earth was round or flat? Why would they hold the earth as flat? Yeah, because you go out the door here, you say the quad, that's pretty, you know, flat and things like that. And you, you know, you look around, the earth looks pretty flat. The people those days would have held the earth as flat, okay? By the way, is it possible the Bible could even refer to something like that? Has anybody ever heard of the four corners of the earth referred to in the Bible? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12, four corners of the earth. That means the earth's flat. Does it? Now, when you say four corners of the earth, does that mean it's a flat earth? By the way, some Christians who are opposing a round earth argued that the earth was flat based on that passage in Isaiah. Is that what Isaiah means? Has, does anybody here talk about the four corners of the earth? If you said the four corners of the earth today, does that mean you think the earth's flat? No. Is that just a literary way of saying the four corners of the earth, north, south, east, and west? You know, you're just saying like that. Okay, you're not saying the earth's flat. So the Bible's not wrong there. It's just as it's people misunderstood it. Okay, where did Moses get the language he wrote? And what I try to suggest is that Abraham and his descendants, Jacob and etc., picked up the language of Canaan when they're in the land of Canaan, and that was passed down to Moses. Was Moses trained under his own parents? He was trained by Pharaoh's daughter in the wisdom of Egypt, but was he first trained by his own parents? Do you remember he was put in a basket, went down the Nile River? When Pharaoh's daughter picked him up, she said, this is a Hebrew, this is a child of the Hebrews. And basically what happened is she says, this is a child of the Hebrews. I think he was probably circumcised. And so she picked him up, this guy of the Hebrews and stuff. And then what happens is she gives him then Miriam, Moses' older sister, shows up and says, hey, I'm Jewish and stuff. And so she gives Moses back to his own sister. Older sister, younger brother like that, there's something wrong with that, okay? Older sister ever boss you around? Anyways, so, so anyways, the older sister takes Moses back and his own parents, his own, Moses' own parents raise him, okay? Or as my wife would say, rear, reared him, okay? So he's raised till he's probably, what, 12 or 13, adolescence, and then when he gets adolescence, he goes to Pharaoh's daughter, he gets trained in all the stuff of Egypt and things. Would he know how to speak Hebrew fluently? Uh, you get raised in a family until you're 12 years old or so. Do you know the language pretty much for the rest of your life? Uh, my, my son-in-law married my daughter. Um, he's from Taiwan, and he was raised in Taiwan till he was 12. When he comes to English, can he speak English fluently? Uh, he still says sheeps and deers, not deer, deers. He puts an S on the end of everything. I mock him out because um, he does that, uh, you know, actually... He's got a problem. I mean, he took the SAT. The SAT was in English. He missed five points on the SAT. Okay. So the kid's pretty, or the man, guy, he's married to my daughter. I guess he's a man. Okay. I better get out of this. All right. <laughs> what I'm saying is, I'm saying is, he missed five points on his SAT. He's a guy pretty bright. Okay. He went to Harvard, went to MIT. Okay. The guy's pretty bright and stuff. But he still says sheeps and he still says, so we get him on that. But, but question, does the guy know, does he know Mandarin? No, he was raised till he's 12 at, at, at Taiwan. Does he still know Mandarin fluently? Yeah, okay. So I'm saying, was where you raised? So Moses knew this stuff in his childhood and stuff. And so, okay, let me get out of there. Um, can non-Jewish, non-profits, pagan people say some things that are true? Can some pagan people say things that are true? Yes, and if Moses records what those pagan people says is something true, it's in the Bible, it's still true. You know, so be careful, you know, with some of the stuff. Did God accommodate his truth to express things in a way that was in harmony with the way the ancient man saw things? Okay, he accommodated himself in language, okay? So God speaks in Hebrew. He uses the literary forms of the day. How much did he accommodate himself to, I mean, did God come down to, to Moses and say, Moses, Moses, you guys think the earth's flat. The earth's not flat, it's round. Did God ever come down and straighten them out? No, that wasn't the point. God was coming down to tell them about their souls and about redemption, not about scientific fact, okay? So you kind of got to take a break on that stuff a little bit. Now, why did Moses include the creation? Why did Moses start out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Did Moses write Genesis 1 and 2 to fight against evolutionary theory? Did Moses write the Genesis account to fight against evolutionary theory? 
did Moses have a clue about evolutionary theory? No, that's in the 19th and 20th century, okay? So Moses did not write against evolutionary theory. Moses had no clue, nor did any of the people that he was addressing know that. Now what I'm working on here is hermeneutics, what's called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, does anybody know hermeneutics is a study of how you interpret the Bible. How you interpret the Bible. Different people interpret the Bible differently. Hermeneutics is how you interpret. And notice what I'm pushing here. Fight against evolutionary theory. Is that our problem, fighting evolutionary theory in our day? Did Moses know about that? I'm getting, trying to get you back into the original intent of the original author. In other words, the Bible isn't necessary for me, 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 me. We live in a narcissistic culture that says me, me, me all the time. What I'm trying to do is get you out of you and look back at how Moses, as an, a writer, how he originally intended it. What did Moses originally intend? What was the original intent for Moses? So that's my hermeneutic, is to try to get back to the original intent of the original writers. Okay? Did Moses probably write it as a polemic against polytheism? Were the people back then polytheistic? Many gods doing all this stuff. So it's possible, is that fit Moses a lot better than evolution? Yeah, because they were struggling with polytheism, and so it's possible he starts out, no, no, it's not Baal and Asherah went to war and Baal cut her up and stuff. There was one God, and he made everything, and how did he make it? He spoke, and things came into being. So Moses is possibly working against polytheism, and I think this is the real point in which Moses is dealing in the book of Genesis, is that Moses is basically saying, Genesis 1 is a doxology. It's for praise and worship of God. It tells us something about God, his majesty, the, the greatness and goodness of God in the creation. The greatness and goodness of God in the creation account. Now, how do I know this was part of the purpose? I look over to Psalm 136. Psalm shows us how the Genesis account can be used. And I'm going to put this up here and then just see this beautiful Psalm. What does this Psalm speak of? Psalm 136. To him who alone does great wonders, for his loyal love endures forever. By Who by his understanding made the heavens, for his loyal love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, for his loyal love endures forever. Who made the great lights, for his loyal love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, for his loyal love endures forever. What's the point of this psalm? He looks at creation, and what does he conclude? It's very difficult. What does he conclude? His loyal love endures forever, okay? And so in other words, can you look at the creation and learn something about God? Can scientists, some of you guys are going into science and scales are going into science and things. Should you be able to look at science and have science and should it lead you to worship of God? Should your study of physics lead you to the worship of God? Should your study of biology lead you to the worship of God? Should chemistry lead you to the worship of God? Is, is physics only, you know, F equals MA or, or V equals IR, you know, and say, oh, I know physics, so yeah, V equals IR, okay? Um, is that really the essence of it? Or can you see past the formulas to what? You're talking about galaxies. You're talking about what God made and stuff. And you can see the handiwork of God. So what I'm saying is take the sciences. Yes, learn your formulas and things like that. But go beyond the formulas to see the beauty of God in creation. Physics, chemistry, biology, whatever. Here's another one. These guys are in heaven. These guys are in heaven in the book of Revelation. And guess what they're doing in heaven? This is what, you know, we're going to be doing in heaven. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive, to receive what? Glory, honor, and power. Why is God worthy of receiving glory, honor, and power? For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So, beautiful verse going on in heaven. Now, does create always mean create out of nothing? There's a Latin term that I, I do want you to know this. The Latin term, create out of nothing, is create ex nihilo. Ex, does anybody do Latin anymore? Ex, like out of, nihilo, nothing. Out of nothing. Does God create out of nothing? Can God create out of nothing? God spoke and it came into being. So God creates, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He creates out of nothing, ex nihilo. Does God always create ex nihilo? Okay. 
Psalm 33, 6, beautiful verse. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, the styry host by the breath of his mouth. That's really cool. God spoke and the universes came into being. Did God always do it that way, though? No. Did God do what? God barred man out of the what? Out of the dust. He shaped man. He created man out of the dust. Did he form man out of nothing? Some women would say, yeah, okay. But, but anyway, did God form man out of nothing? No, he formed him out of the dust. Now, by the way, because you guys don't know Hebrew, you missed, there's some beautiful plays on words in the book of Genesis, okay? God takes the dust of the ground and he forms, and he forms what? Does, does God call the being that he shapes out of the ground, does he call him a name? He calls him Adam, by you guys. He calls him Adam. What does Adam mean? He takes the dust, he shapes it in, and he calls him Dusty. No, I, no, this isn't a joke. This is the honest truth. Adam, what does Adam mean? Adam means dirt, ground, dust. Okay, So he shapes Adam out of the dust, and he calls him Dusty. That's the honest truth. Adam's name means Dusty. Okay? This, no, there's, do you see there's a play on words there? There's a play on words there. It's beautiful. By the way, what does he call Eve? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who names Eve? Adam names Eve. When does Adam name Eve? After Adam is told, Adam, you sinned. Dust you are. Dusty, dusty you are. Dust you shall return. The next verse, in chapter 3, verse 20, Adam turns to Eve. She has not been named in the narrative so far. He turns to his wife just after he has been told that he's going to have to work his tail off and he's going to end up losing, the dust's going to win. Dusty's going to become dusty again. He turns to his wife and he says, You, death woman, evil woman, destroyer woman. What does he name her? He turns to her and he says, Chava. Now, you guys know what chava is. You go to a Jewish wedding. They pull out the... I was, oh, you guys are under 21. Okay, don't, uh, don't do this at a Jewish wedding. Anyways, they pull out the Jewish wedding, they fill up the thing, and they start clicking the things between them, and they say, la what? La chaim. La chaim. You guys know that. You've all seen Fiddler on the Roof, right? By the way, they don't tell you this at Gordon College, but uh, one of the graduation requirements is Fiddler on the Roof. You, you have to see Fiddler on the Roof before they let you graduate. I'm, I'm serious. If you go across that stage to get your diploma and stuff, well, Dr. Wilson's got one of those airsoft guns. You go across there, he pops you. If you haven't seen Fiddler on the Roof, man, you get popped, man. He just, uh, so you got to, you have to see Fiddler on the Roof. If you haven't seen Fiddler on the Roof, you got to see Fiddler. L'chaim, L'chaim. By the way, what is the root of L'chaim? Chava and Lachaim are basically the same word. He turns to his wife and he says, what? What does Lachaim mean to life? He turns to this woman and he says, Chava, you are the mother of all living. I'm going to dust. You are the mother of all living. Does this woman bring hope to him that someday the serpent's head is going to be crushed? And where does life come from? Does life come from this woman? And so he names her the living one, the, mo the mother of all living, Chava. Is that a beautiful, does that show a beautiful relationship between Adam and Eve? He doesn't curse her after he's cursed and stuff. He turns to her and he sees the hope that comes through her. It is through her seed that redemption will come to all mankind. This woman will bring redemption to all mankind. And he looks at her and he says, Chava. You guys say Eve. Let's, uh, I like Chava better, but anyways, we'll do Eve. Okay, so anyways, okay, now, about 10 minutes left. I want to switch over and switch uh, discussions here to the days of Genesis, okay? The days of Genesis, and I want to go through this uh, fairly rapidly and just hit this because I don't want to belabor this point, but the days of creation account. Seven days of creation, seven days of creation. When was the earth created? What does the Bible say? I've tried to say before, the Bible doesn't tell us how old the earth is. There are three approaches to the days of Genesis, and I just want to run through those three approaches, okay? Three approaches to the days of Genesis and how long the days of Genesis were and that kind of thing. So we'll do the days of Genesis. Okay, so first of all, 
Some people hold that the days of Genesis are 24-hour literal days. 24-hour days, uh, 24 hours, dawn till dusk, and the evening, 24-hour period. Those are called the literal 24-hour day theory. A lot of the people that hold this will be called young earth creationists. Young earth creationists will hold that the earth is about uh, 20,000 years old, something like that, 20, 30, 40, 10,000 years old, okay? So it's young earth. The earth is only about 20,000 years old. They, most of the people that are young earth creationists will hold the actual 24-hour day theory. Basically what they say is that the word yom, the word yom there is the word Hebrew word for day. The word yom means day in Hebrew. And they say that it's defined actually in Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 where God says um, in verse 5, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So this oscillation between light and darkness, which is a 24-hour day, that God defines yom in verse 5 of Genesis 1. He says it's this oscillation of light and darkness, which is 24-hour period. So it's defined there for us in Genesis, therefore it should be. The Sabbath. How long do you rest on the Sabbath? 24-hour period. When does the Jewish Sabbath start? Or when is, when is the Jewish Sabbath? Saturday. Okay, the Jews celebrate their Sabbath on Saturday. When does sa the Jewish Shabbat start? Shabbat starts Friday night. The sun goes down. Shabbat starts Friday night. They have the dinner and stuff, Shabbat dinner and stuff. It goes then Saturday. They rest all Saturday. And then when does Shabbat end? No, Saturday night. Okay, it goes from Friday night after the sun goes down to Saturday night when the sun goes down. What do the Jews do Saturday night? Party. Okay, so party... You will see at Kikar Zion in Jerusalem, there will be 10,000 Jews swarming the streets, buying all sorts of stuff, eating pizza and stuff like that. Don't order pepperoni pizza, but just pizza and stuff. And so anyways, but they'll do, they'll do, uh, there's a reason why I said that. Somebody ordered one when I was in the store and the place, there's two, must have been 200 people there. It went silent just like that. The guy ordered pepperoni pizza. I thought, you got it. Anyways, we got out of there. We're obviously Americans and I knew enough to get out of there when it goes silent like that. But anyways, uh, so all I'm saying is Shabbat goes down basically Friday night to Saturday night. Saturday night is usually when they go out and have fun, things like that. 20, is that a 24-hour period? Shabbat, Jewish Shabbat, 24-hour period. And remember God said, by the way, in the Ten Commandments, what? Remember the what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's a 24-hour period. Remember the Sabbath day. Exodus chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. So again, 24-hour this is another argument, day plus a number. Whenever you have day one, day two, day three, it's usually a 24-hour period. Whenever the word day is used with a number, it's usually a 24-hour period in Scripture. There's about 499 of those references. I checked them out once upon a time and wrote a paper on that. The appearance of age. Um, because the earth is so young, you say, but what the earth looks like, it's really, really old. They would say, you know, okay, Dr. Phillips last night was describing uh, galaxies that were like, you know, 10 billion light years away. That light started out from those galaxies, you know, 10 billion years ago. And now the light we're seeing is it really 10 billion years old. These people would say, young Earth would say, no, 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 it didn't start 10 billion years. God made the light already on its way. Adam was made looking like an adult. So the the earth has an appearance of age. And that's what the scientists are seeing, is God made it with the appearance of age. Does that argument bother anybody? That God made the earth with the appearance of age. Okay? Does God deceive people? That, that's an interesting question. Okay. Now, symbolic age. This is another day, uh, another type of day. And what these people who hold the symbolic day say that the days of Genesis, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days, are not meant to be time. They're meant to be a logical or literary framework that Moses is using to describe the creation. It's a logical or literary framework that Moses is using it to describe it. And it could be that God came to Moses and said, and Moses, okay, Moses is sleeping. He's up on the Mount Sinai. God comes to him and says, hey, Moses, wake up. And God shows him, let there be light. And there's light. Moses sees the light and stuff. Then Moses goes back to sleep. The next day, God shakes him. Moses, wake up and things. And he says, okay, watch this. Now I'm going to separate the waters above and the waters below and things. Watch this. Moses goes back to sleep, comes away. Third day, okay, let the land appear. So in other words, it's days that God revealed to Moses. It's not days of the creation, but it's days that God revealed to Moses. Do you see the difference there? 
So these are revelational, what are called revelational days, that God took seven days to reveal it to Moses, not that it was originally that way. Here's another way to look at it. And this, I've thought this often, it's kind of an interesting way, that God showed Moses seven pictures and that Moses is describing in the first picture, God said, let there be light. In the second picture, you know, he separates things. And so God, M Moses has shown these pictures visually, like in his head, the prophets had visions and stuff. God's showing him in visions, the creation. And so he describes it in the seven days. This, this, is this more of abstract? Is this more abstract approach to creation? Yeah, it's more abstract. The other ones are literal 24 hours. This is more abstract. And this is uh, the symbolic days. Bernard Ram holds this. Uh, some of the more abstract thinkers hold that. Here's what Dr. Perry Phillips holds. And this is called the day-age theory, that each one of the days of Genesis are ages, are periods of long periods of time. That the word yom, the word yom in Hebrew, the word day, has a variety of meanings, has a variety of meanings, and not always 24 hours. For example, if I asked you, is it day or night out, what would you say? I've been in this building so long, I don't know. Okay. All right. If I said, is it day or night, how long is day in that context? If I said day or night, how long is day? Is day less than 24 hours? You say, well, we live in New England in December. It's, uh, the day is only five minutes. So anyway, so day can you know, vary. See, 12 hours. So give me 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night and stuff. And so that, that would be shorter than 24 hours. But what about this? What about the day of the Lord? How long is the day of the Lord? The apocalyptic day of the Lord, many people, it's described in the book of Revelation, the day of the Lord is a thousand years. So the day of the Lord is a thousand years. And then if you go over to Psalm chapter 90, verse 4, it says, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. And you guys all know that because you've seen Groundhog's Day. A day is a thousand years goes over the same day every day after day after day. A day is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. When you're with an infinite God, what's a thousand years? It's nothing. So a day is used in a long period of time. Here's another one, and that's the time of a person's life. If I said to you, in my father's day, how long would that be? Would that be about a 72-year period from 1927 to 2005? Okay. So it was a day, my, in my father's day, that would be in his lifetime. So day means many things. It means many things in English. It means many things in Hebrew. The sun, by the way, the sun was not made till day four. Are the first three days solar days? They can't be solar days because there, there's no solar, okay? There's no sun. The sun's gone. The sun doesn't get put in until day four. So the first three days can't be solar days anyway. Now, by the way, does the day-age theory allow for billions of years? Yes, it does, okay? And then this is probably the strongest argument. There's too much work on day six. Can God do stuff, can God do stuff instantaneously? But man, he forms man out of dust or ground on day six. He then brings all the animals to Adam. Does Adam have to name all the animals? Does that take time to name all the animals in the world? And, then, and by the way, after he names all the animals, Adam has to feel alone. And then... Well, okay. And then, and then after that, what happens? On that same sixth day, what happens? Eve is formed out of the rib of his side. Is that a lot to do on one day, 24-hour day? Now, God can do stuff really fast, but there's a human being. Does it take time? So day six, there's so much. And so what happens is you're left with this kind of a thing. These are the three approaches. Literal days, day one, day two, these are actual 24-hour days. These people are your young earth creationists. The earth is about 20,000 years old. The day age... Does this allow for a 13.7 billion year old universe that science largely agrees with? Yeah. The Big Bang Theory by Perry Phillips I'll have up on the web by Friday or more realistic phrase tomorrow. Um, probably by Monday. And then the symbolic days. Does this also, symbolic days, does it allow for billions of years? Now the question is, and this is the, the point of all this, how old does the earth, how old does the Bible say the earth is? It doesn't say. Is that conjecture on everybody's part? Will you have some young earth people? You'll have some young earth people. You'll have some older people. And all I'm saying is don't fight over these things. The Bible doesn't really say. People hold different opinions. It's okay to hold different opinions on this, okay? Major on the major, minor on the minors. The date of the earth, we don't know. Scripture doesn't say. So take care. We'll see you Tuesday.
This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in lecture number five in the course Old Testament History, Literature, and Theology. Today's lecture will be on Genesis chapter 1, on verses 1 1 and 1 2, and then a discussion of the days of Genesis. Dr. Ted Hildebrandt. <music> 